Thank you for joining my presentation on mechanical ventilation advanced modes and NIV ventilation. This is a review course for the adult critical care specialist exam. This particular presentation will last approximately 30 minutes. My name is Taryn Shenfield and I am the co-owner of A&T Respiratory Lectures. Before we get much further, I wanted to talk a little bit about automatic tube compensation. Automatic tube compensation is an algorithm that is put on most um, ICU ventilators today. Basically what it does, it compensates for the resistance in an endotracheal tube or a trach. Basically you dial in the size of the endotracheal tube, you also would dial in the size of a trach. And what that will do will add a little bit of pressure support to the ventilator that will compensate only for the resistance that occurs in the endotracheal tube. What this results in was when you wean a patient from mechanical ventilation, um, you get a true reading of what kind of tidal volumes the patients are doing. So it reduces the work of breathing involved with the endotracheal tube due to the size of the tube and the resistance of the tube. It is a great weaning mode, so sometimes people who fail um, pressure support weans, you don't know if the pressure support is overly compensating for the patient's breathing, but if you put them on automatic tube compensation, you could just eliminate the resistance in the tube. And the key point here, it doesn't overshoot the pressure support breath. So in other words, it will not augment a tidal volume that the patient is getting. It'll only reduce the resistance in the endotracheal tube or a trach, whatever you set it up for. So I just wanted you to know a little bit about that because sometimes questions come up on that. So you might be wondering, why do manufacturers come up with new modes of ventilation? Um, you know, why don't they just use the cis control or SIMV or pressure support breaths? And the reason is, over the years, you know, technology has really improved. And it got to a point that right now, many of these mechanical ventilators, especially the ones in Europe, can self-wean. You know, so they don't even need too much interaction from the clinician at the bedside because you could put them on an automatic wean mode. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about that as we move along. But a lot of evidence has shown that these new modes of ventilation decrease ICU days. And, you know, being in an ICU is very expensive. So you really want to do whatever you can to uh, decrease their ICU days. You also want to decrease their length of stay in the hospital, which, you know, directly uh, improves cost involved. Um, also resource utilization. If you have a mode of ventilation that could automatically titrate pressure support up and down, you don't need to have that clinician right there at the bedside every moment to decrease the pressure support. You could put them on one of the advanced modes of ventilation and they could automatically wean. The quicker the patient gets off the ventilator, the, the lower rates of VAP that occur. So getting the patient off the ventilator is really important. And the final aspect of these new modes of ventilation is because we want to encourage spontaneous breathing. A lot of these patients are on who are on assist control can be automatically moved from full support on mechanical ventilation to a pressure support mode automatically without the clinician going there and changing the modes. So this will encourage spontaneous breathing. So for example, if someone's on assist control and they have a rate of say 12, and all of a sudden their rate goes up to 14 and 16, the assist control rate can go down and then pressure support can be augmented to um, get you a, a proper tidal volume. So there's a lot of good reasons why these new modes of ventilation are going on and you should just know a little bit why the reason for it. So some of the advanced modes we're gonna be talking about today is APRV, which um, is a term coined on the Draga medical ventilator. We'll be talking about PAV, which is proportional assist ventilation, which is uh, trademarked by the Puritan Bennett Company. And we have NAVA, which is um, neurally adjusted ventilatory assist, which is on the servo ventilators. 
Then we have volume support ventilation. Volume support ventilation is on a bunch of different manufacturers. We have PRVC, which is on the servo. Uh, we have ASV, which is adaptive support ventilation, which is on the Hamilton medical ventilator. And then we're going to be talking a little bit about the high frequency oscillator. And we have both the 3100A, which is designed for um, pediatrics and neonates. And we have the 3100B, which was designed for adults, and that's by Viair uh, Medical. So we're going to be talking about each of these modes of ventilation. These are advanced modes of ventilation, uh, and you're going to learn a lot more about it. And hopefully, if you ever asked any questions on the exam, you'll understand exactly how it works. Let's start our conversation about the high-frequency oscillator ventilator. Um, you may see this kind of questions on the exam. Uh, what they will be referring to is most likely patients with some kind of air leak syndrome, like, you know, a pneumothorax, or it could be talking about someone with ARDS. The, call, the whole point of this would be to reduce volume trauma to the patient. So a high frequency oscillating ventilator is utilized when typically conventional ventilation fails. So one of the key points there, if your mechanical ventilator fails under your normal settings, what do you do? It reduces the risk of volume trauma and it could actually prevent ventilator induced lung injury. It maintains a constant alveolar inflation, which is developed by the mean airway pressure. Mean airway pressure keeps the alveolar inflated. Um, in regard to this exam, this is the adult exam, so the typical hertz is set anywhere from four to eight. And remember, one hertz is equal to 60 breaths per minute. That is much as you really need to understand that the use of high frequency oscillator is used when conventional ventilation fails. Number one, it's used for ARDS patients, and it's also used for patients who have leak syndrome, where they have, you know, a pneumothoracy and you don't want to overly inflate the lung. So these are the purposes of it, and you might definitely see this on the exam. Another type of rescue ventilation, and maybe not all the time rescue ventilation, is APRV. APRV stands for Airway Pressure Release Ventilation. The term APRV is used on the Draeger ventilator, but there is also different names for this type of ventilation on different manufacturers, such as biphasics or bi or bi-level ventilation. And the whole point of this is to deliver two constant pressures to the patient, commonly known as a P high and P low. P stands for high pressure and P low stands for low pressure. P high is normally set from plateau pressure. So you'll get the plateau pressure of the patient on conventional ventilation and that will become your P high. Your P low is normally set to zero. Your T high is your total inspiration time. T high is total inspiration time. T low is your exhalation time. T high, they normally have a long inspiratory phase to APRV, almost like four to six seconds with an adult. So when you think about this is inverse IE ratio pressure control ventilation. When is it used? It's used for acute lung injury. It's used for ARDS. It's also used for extensive atelectasis, diffuse pneumonia, tracheoesophageal fistula. There's many good reasons why you want to use it. You may not want to use it on a COPD patient. So you might get a question, would APRV be good for a COPD patient? And the answer would be no. Remember, it's almost like pressure control ventilation with an inverse IE ratio. One of the advantages of APRV is that you don't have to use much sedation and the patient can spontaneously breathe throughout the respiratory cycle. So this is one of the key points you might see on the exam. Um, APRV would be a good choice of ventilation when you wanna use decreased sedation and you also want the patient to spontaneously breathe. When you think about inverse IE ratio, uh, pressure control ventilation, typically the patient is sedated or paralyzed. But with APRV, you don't need that. And has a long inspiratory time. And the point of this long inspiratory time is to improve alveolar recruitment and the 
point of the T low, the time low, is to have an exhalation phase. So those are your basic understandings of APRV. Just remember P high, P low, P high is plateau pressure, P low is zero, T high, T low, T high is normally set to about four to six seconds. T low could be anywhere from 0.6 seconds to 1.5 seconds. So those are a very good choice for you on patients with these kind of indications like I mentioned before. Another good mode of ventilation, uh, which is an advanced mode, is called proportional assist ventilation, commonly known as POV. Basically, it was designed to decrease the work of breathing and to improve patient ventilator synchrony. So the key point here is why is patient ventilator synchrony important? Most patients on mechanical ventilation buck the ventilator. It's just an uncomfortable feeling for a patient to breathe on a ventilator. So, and a lot of has to do with triggering, with the way the ventilator triggers. But with POV, the patient can trigger a breath and they can actually bring in as much tidal volume as they want based upon their inspiratory needs. So what happens is this ventilator measures compliance and resistance breath by breath, and based upon that, will give a variable level of pressure support. Most ventilators have a fixed level of pressure support. So you put a pressure support of 10, you put a pressure support of 12, and every breath comes in with that particular pressure support. But this ventilator, based on the compliance and resistance of the lung, it will have a variable pressure support. If the patient needs more pressure support for a bigger tidal volume, it will deliver it automatically. If the patient needs less because their inspiratory demand is really strong, it will give a less pressure support. So this is a great weaning mode. In other words, the patient could be weaned down from pressure support automatically. Um, it reduces the work of breathing because the breathing pattern is more natural. Um, it works by augmenting the patient efforts. That's the key point here. Based upon the patient's inspiratory needs and whether they need a higher level of pressure support or a lower level of pressure support, this particular mode of ventilation will deliver it automatically based on compliance and resistance. And it really uh, customizes each breath um, based upon the patient's effort. This is the key point here. It's especially helpful for COPD patients. So if you get a question on the exam asking about what kind of uh, mode of ventilation might be good for someone who's failed uh, typical weaning processes, who's a COPD, -er, anyone who's an acute on chronic hypercapnic patient COPD, -er, these patients really benefit quite well from POV. So that's a little bit about POV and you should know a little bit more about it and you can read up on yourself. NAVA is another mode of ventilation that is considered one of those boutique modes. Uh, NAVA stands for Neurally Adjusted Ventilatory Assist. It's on the servo ventilator, and how it works, it, there's a couple of electrodes that pick up the signal of the diaphragm. So when the diaphragm retracts to take a breath, it picks up that signal and it'll deliver a breath, especially with pressure support. The advantage of this is it improves synchrony. So patients who are asynchronous with the ventilator, meaning that they buck the ventilator or if they try to trigger the ventilator and it doesn't give them a breath, um, this particular mode of ventilation will work much better at picking up that signal. As their patient's improvement, as their condition improves over time, the electrical signal that is picked up decreases and the pressure support can be dropped with that so the patient could start weaning. Um, there's a lot of advantages to NAVA. So maybe one of the questions you might see on the exam is the patient is triggering the breath, but it's really not picking up anything. What would be your suggestion? And your suggestion is maybe use NAVA because NAVA will pick up that breath and deliver the breath to the patient. Um, there's not a, a lot of strong supporting literature with the adults. They have used this extensively for the neonate population, which works very well. 
uh, but it does work very well. You know, it will pick, it will improve ventilator synchrony, especially with patients who are mistriggering the ventilator. So if you see any questions regarding the triggering of the ventilator and the ventilator is not picking up the signal, NAVA may be the correct answer. As mentioned on the previous slide, it's much more responsive to the patient's breath. Um, it actually does a much better job than pressure and flow triggering. So maybe that is where the question is being uh, posed that you have a patient on um, you know, ventilation and they're using as a trigger pressure triggering or flow triggering and it's not picking up what would be a good solution and a good solution could be NAVA. Um, it actually reduces the work of breathing because the way it works, it's, it picks up the signal of the breath so you don't get many missed breaths. So NAVA is a very good tool for mistriggering of the ventilator and in decreasing the work of breathing by ventilators that are not picking up flow triggering or pressure triggering. And you got to base your question and answer based on those kind of knowledge. Let's talk about a mode of ventilation called PRVC, which is offered on the servo ventilator. Um, PRVC is a type of pressure control ventilation with a targeted tidal volume. So basically, you have a targeted tidal volume, say, of 500 cc, and you will be delivering that breath via a pressure control mode. So the advantage of this is that when you set up someone on volume cycle ventilation and you set up a peak flow, you're setting up peak inspiratory flow based upon your own concept. You might think of 60 liters per minute, you might think of 50, you might think of 40, whatever number you have. So you really don't know what the peak inspiratory demand of that patient is. But when you do volume cycle ventilation, that is sort of the disadvantages. But when you use pressure control ventilation, you have a variable peak inspiratory pressure based upon the inspiratory needs of the patient. So based upon their compliance and resistance, you get a targeted tidal volume at a lower level of pressure. The advantages of PRVC, it delivers a targeted tidal volume at a lower pressure. It improves gas exchange, and but there are some flip sides to that. It also can worsen air trapping. So with that in mind, you might get a question about what kind of mode of ventilation would you not use for a patient who is trapping or a COPD or a retainer? And the answer would be PRVC because it's not the particularly best mode to use on a COPD or someone with severe asthma. So PRVC is a volume targeted mode. It's pressure controlled. It delivers lower pressures to the airway. It has a variable flow and it works very well with patients. And I have another slide that's gonna talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. With the servo ventilator with PRVC, they have another feature where they combine PRVC with auto mode. Auto mode combi combines the concept of PRVC with volume cycle ventilation. So basically, you could wean automatically from pressure control ventilation to pressure support ventilation. And this is based upon the inspiratory needs of the patient. It's also based upon the compliance and resistance. So just think about PRVC with auto mode would be very effective with a patient who is weaning. It's an automatic weaning mode from uh, pressure control to pressure support. It has a variable um, pressure support level being delivered breath by breath. And if the patient becomes apneic, it'll automatically cycle them back to PRVC. So think about PRVC with auto mode as a weaning tool that could be used with a patient. I just thought I'd throw this out there. There was a study done in 2001 by Roth, and basically they compared PRVC with auto mode versus SIMV in regard to weaning patients. So they had a population of 40 patients, 
And what they found was that the auto mode, the PRVC with auto mode versus SIMV resulted in a, de in a decrease in weaning time from 169 minutes if you used SIMV versus 136 minutes if you used uh, auto mode with PRVC. So really that's not st statistically significant. Um, it really, it had a little bit decreased therapist interaction, but the real results of this study was not overwhelmingly supportive of PRVC with auto mode. Just wanted to throw that out there so you have a little bit better understanding. Another good mode of ventilation is called adaptive support ventilation. It is on the Galileo, Galileo Hamilton medical device. Basically, this is an automatically weaning mode of ventilation where based upon the patient's ideal body weight, you could determine the minute ventilation for that patient based upon their weight, based upon their sex, and you dial that in. You also dial in the maximum inspiratory pressure that you want to allow. And what happens based upon the ventilator calculating the compliance and resistance, it will give a certain level of pressure support to the patient uh, to optimize ventilation. Uh, they use this old equation called the Otis equation, which is um, a little bit more detailed to get into. But basically, um, once you dial in the minute ventilation, the percent minute ventilation that is required, um, and based upon how the patient is spontaneously breathing or lack of spontaneously breathing, it will titrate enough pressure support to the patient to start weaning the patient automatically. Um, all the, patient, the therapist has to do is decrease the percent of minute ventilation as the patient starts breathing more and more. So I have a little bit more on the next slide on this, but this is a really good automatic weaning mode. It's called adaptive, adaptive support ventilation. It's on the Galileo um, ventilator. So as I was mentioning, it first starts you off in pressure control ventilation, and then automatically it'll switch you over to pressure support ventilation based upon the patient's spontaneous breathing. And as time goes on, the therapist will decrease the percent minute ventilation set up by the device. Like I mentioned previously, this is an automatic weaning mode. It's especially good for weaning COPD patients. So that's where you might see this on the test. They might ask you what kind of patient uh, would benefit from this, or they might give you a case study of a COPD patient and different modes of ventilation. And this can really be helpful in this group. It's also helped with post cardiac surgery patients, but it's not too good for obese patients due to low FRC. So that might be a contraindication to the use of adaptive support ventilation. Finally, we get up to smart care. Smart care is on the Draeger medical ventilator, the XL ventilator. They probably came up with a new device, but um, smart care is a Draeger product. Basically, you have entitled CO2 attached to the system. It's called a closed loop system. And what it does, it monitors the CO2 level automatically. And based upon your CO2 level, it will titrate pressure support automatically. So what this is, is an automatic weaning mode. So small care is an automatic weaning mode. It uses CO2 to measure, you know, exactly what's going on. So as a patient breathe spontaneously and they blow off their CO2, the amount of pressure support will decrease. Uh, many studies have shown this decreases ventilator days, decreases ICU days, and actually decreases therapist interaction with the ventilator. It's used exclusively in Europe, so I just wanted you to know about another mode of ventilation that is an automatic weaning mode. And this is the last of the modes. I wanted to mention about optimal PEEP studies, and you're going to definitely see this on the exam. Basically, when you have a patient on a ventilator, you want to make the highest FiO2 
In other words, you want to increase your FiO2 up to 60%, and if you don't get the results you're looking for for the PaO2, you next want to do is increase PEEP. So you want to increase PEEP to optimize ventilation, to optimize alveolar recruitment, but you don't want to overly distend the alveolar so that you uh, end up having decreased venous return and cardiac output. So one of the ways of doing an optimal PEEP study is to titrate the PEEP up and up and up. First of all, you need to have the FiO2 to a maximum level of 60. Then what you do is you increase your PEEP in increments of two, and you look at the saturations, and we also look at the blood pressure. As soon as you see the saturations climbing, 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 based upon your, your increase in the PEEP, but all of a sudden you start seeing a decrease in blood pressure, then you back off. That is how you do an optimal PEEP study. So you look at comp cardiac compromise. So you dial in the PEEP, you dial in the PEEP, you dial in the PEEP in increments of two. When you see a decrease in blood pressure, and but you see an increase in SATs, that's when you back off. So that is one of the methods they use. So now we're going to start talking about non-invasive ventilation. And when you talk about non-invasive ventilation, you're talking about you don't have an artificial airway. It includes non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, MPPV. It also includes CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. And I'm sure you know about this, but I'm going to teach you some other stuff you might not know. There are many reasons why to use um, non-invasive ventilation in the acute care setting. So I'm talking about in the ICU. It's very good for improving gas exchange, especially with someone with an exasperation of the COPD. It avoids intubation, which is critical. If you can avoid intubation, you avoid VAP. It also decreases mortality. Um, it could decrease the length of time that you stay in the ICU and, in the, and also in the hospital, uh, decrease the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia, it can relieve symptoms of respiratory distress, and it can maximize patient comfort. But this is a double-edged sword. Sometimes some patients don't do very well with non-invasive ventilation, but it is really quite used in the ICU. Non-invasive ventilation could also be used in long-term settings. A lot of patients use non-invasive ventilation at home if they have um, some kind of sleep disorder or if they have a severe COPD. It, re it relieves symptoms, it improves quality of life, it avoids hospitalizations, increases su uh, survivability, and also improves mobility. So a lot of patients will use this in a home setting, especially if they have um, neuromuscular disease or hypoventilation syndrome or severe cases of COPD. These are some of the key indicators for the use of non-invasive ventilation. Some of the key considerations of using non-invasive ventilations is for a patient who has an exasperation of COPD. If you are in hypercapnic respiratory failure, this is your primary tool to use. There's been strong evidence that it decreases the need for intubation, decreases mortality, decreases hospital stay, and this is your standard of care. This is your first line of therapy. So if you ever get any questions about what kind of modality do you want to use for a patient with an exasperation of COPD, you do want to think of non-invasive ventilation. This is a trick question. Sometimes they ask about an asthmatic who is uh, failing their CO2 levels are going up and they look confused and everything like that. Would you put them on non-invasive? Many studies have shown that even though it sort of makes sense, it really doesn't work. Recent reviews have concluded there's not enough evidence to support the use of non-invasive ventilation in an acute asthma attack rather than intubation. If someone starts failing, it's better to intubate them than uh, to put them on non-invasive ventilation, especially for asthmatics. So just keep that in mind too during the exam. So what about the use of non-invasive ventilation to facilitate weaning or extubation attempts with a patient on mechanical ventilation. This is really important for the COPD patient. 
I've seen some questions on the adult critical care specialist exam where they talk about a patient who has failed weaning attempts and they also give you the story that the patient is a COPD -er, and they failed multiple attempts. So one of the good strategies to uh, wean someone from mechanical ventilation and have a successful extubation, especially if someone failed an extubation attempt, is to extubate them from mechanical ventilation to non-invasive ventilation, especially with the COPD patients. This has been shown, uh, there's a lot of evidence that this has worked very well in this population. And also for those who are an adult respiratory failure, this is someone who has failed multiple weaning attempts. This is a good strategy to put them on NIV after extubation. For acute care indications for the use of non-invasive ventilation, there are two types of cases. One would be hypoxic respiratory failure, and the other one would be acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Regarding hypoxic respiratory failure, clinical trials have shown that acute hypoxic respiratory failure without having hypercapnia has been shown to have mixed results. In other words, NIV is really good for if you're hypercapnic, but if you are in hypoxic respiratory failure, the results are sort of mixed. There was some comparison of using NIV for hypoxic respiratory failure versus high flow nasal cannula, and the NIV device came out to be a little bit superior on some trials they've done. Regarding acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, CPAP of anywhere from 8 to 12 has been shown to be a first-line therapy to treat it, and it's been shown to be quite, quite, quite successful. Sometimes patients who are in ventilatory failure um, can benefit from NIV, but CPAP for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema is best unless you are retaining CO2. Regarding hypoxic respiratory failure, uh, this, it's sort of mixed there unless you're hypercapnic. So those are some of the acute care indications of the use of um, non-invasive ventilation. Regarding the use of non-invasive ventilation for pneumonia, Clinical trials have shown that unless the patient has COPD, uh, they really don't benefit much from non-invasive ventilation for pneumonia. Basically, the use of a high-flow nasal cannula might be better in this particular case. Regarding acute lung injury in ARDS, um, a lot of these patients uh, are profoundly hypoxic and also have metabolic acidosis, so the evidence up to this point does not support the use of non-invasive ventilation in these patients, and you should be looking at the PF ratio. So basically, for acute lung injury and ARDS, you do not want to use non-invasive ventilation. Probably intubation is a better choice. This is quite, quite interesting. Patients who are immunosuppressed, such as patients with cancer who are on cancer medication, also HIV patients, um, if they are awaiting a solid organ transplantation and they develop hypoxic respiratory failure, they found that the use of non-invasive ventilation uh, was better compared to standard therapy. So in other words, it must be the reason that they don't aspirate and they don't get any kind of pneumonia versus being intubated. So for immunosuppressed patients, non-invasive ventilation might be a good choice. How about those who are on comfort measures, do not intubate? Patients who do not intubate or are on comfort measure or hospice can benefit from the use of non-invasive ventilation to make them more comfortable. This has been shown to be quite effective in this particular group, so pay attention. Sometimes questions on the test talk about comfort measures and the use of non-invasive ventilation, and it's, it's, it's suggested that it's a good choice. Regarding post-operative use, um, there's insufficient evidence shown to support the use of NIV as a first line of choice. Well, if you're talking about someone who failed, 
if you're going to extubate someone, then put them on non-invasive ventilation, that's promising. But to go directly to non-invasive ventilation is not a really good choice. This sort of furthers the conversation regarding the use of non-invasive ventilation for post-operative respiratory failure. Uh, you have to be careful with these patients. Sometimes, um, if they you if you use not if someone is post-operative and you extubate them and they start going into um, hypoxic respiratory failure, you could try for a short period of time NIV. But if they, they don't improve rather quickly, you really need to intubate. Also um, shown patients who have high reintubation rates. Patients who have been extubated and reintubated and extubated and reintubated have shown some benefit with the use of NIV uh, as a standby. You know, so you extubate them, you put them on NIV, it might be a little bit better choice than reintubating. But if they fail the NIV, you have to really intubate them rather quickly. But you could try with people who failed extubation attempts. How about the use of non-invasive ventilation with a patient who is a stable COPD? So basically, um, it will improve gas exchange and it may unload respiratory muscles, allowing them to recover and gain strength but you really can't think about it as a long-term possibility for someone with stable COPD. But there are some COPD patients who have nocturnal hypoventilation and sleep disordered breathing. They directly benefit from the use of non-invasive ventilation at night. So BiPAP for this particular group, those with um, nocturnal hypoventilation and sleep disordered breathing can really benefit, but there's really not enough evidence showing that someone with stable COPD can benefit from the use of non-invasive ventilation. So think about the other group who can benefit benefit. Sometimes you will get a question talking about obesity hypoventilation syndrome or Pickwinium syndrome. Basically these patients are desat during the evening and they can really benefit from the use of non-invasive ventilation. Even sometimes during the day they hypoventilate and they uh, can benefit from the use of uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So in this particular group, those who have nocturnal desaturations, those with obesity hypoventilation syndrome, those two groups do benefit from the use of non-invasive ventilation and especially for the later group with the ones that have nocturnal desats. So let's talk about set, selecting the appropriate patient for the use of non-invasive ventilation. Basically, if someone's in acute respiratory failure, especially hypercapnic respiratory failure, non-invasive ventilation is a go-to. That's your first choice. Or if you have two or more of the following, if you are using accessory muscles to breathe, you have paradoxal breathing, your respiratory rate is greater than 25, you have moderate to severe dyspnea, uh, your PCO2 is greater than 45, with a pH that's less than 7.35, or your PF ratio is less than 200. Those are other indications for the use of non-invasive ventilation. But remember the second part, you have to have two or more of those to be present. So those kind of patients really could benefit from the use of NIV, and you should try that as a first line of defense. These are tricky questions that sometimes you'll see on the exam. So they're going to give you a choice of whether to intubate the patient or to put them on non-invasive ventilation. And the exclusion criteria, if the patient's apneic for any reason, intubate. If they have the inability to protect the airway or their high aspiration risk, intubate. If they are hemodynamically or instability or instability, intubate. If they have lack of patient cooperation, if the patient can't listen to you or tries to take off the mask, intubate. Um, if they have any kind of facial trauma or facial burns or abnormal anatomy, you might have to intubate. Also, it's secretions. If they have too much secretions, that's another 
contraindication for the use of non-invasive ventilation. So for all of these criteria, you should think about not using NIV in them and possibly directly intubate. So how do you know that your NIV intervention is successful? These are some predictors of success. Uh, they're not always 100% true, but really they're pretty powerful. If you have a minimal air leak less than 24 liters per minute, that's a good sign. If you have a low severity of score by your Apache 2 score, that's another good sign. Apache 2 scores are ways of assessing the patient when they come in to the emergency room or the hospital, and you look at how their chronic illnesses occur, their age, their blood pressure, and a bunch of different variables. And if they have a low score, that's another reason for success. If respiratory acidosis, if the PCO2 is greater than 45, but less than 92, that's another success. pH less than 37.35, but greater than 7.22, another indication of the success. If you have an improvement of gas exchange within one or two hours after the initiation of non-invasive ventilation, that is a good sign. I could also say to you, if someone's on non-invasive ventilation for one or two hours and they do not make an improvement, you have to intubate, otherwise your mortality goes up. And that's a trick question you'll see. Someone's been on non-invasive ventilation, they've been on for a couple hours, what do you do? And you intubate them. You don't adjust the settings. You know, you had one or two hours to work with them and if you couldn't do it, um, you know, too bad, time to intubate. Also, you can see an improvement of respiratory rate and heart rate. Those are another indications of a positive response to non-invasive ventilation. But be careful about keeping someone on NIV for greater than two hours because you need to really intubate them. Some patients have restrictive thoracic disease and may need non-invasive ventilation. These patients can be either pulmonary fibrosis, sarcoidosis, obesity, ALS. Sometimes these patients, as a result of their restrictive disorder, have hypoventilation and lack of sleep quality. So for those patients who can really benefit from non-invasive ventilation, you want to make sure that they meet certain criteria, that their PCO2 is greater than 45, that their nocturnal oxygen saturations is less than 88% for greater than five minutes, that their maximum inspiratory pressure is less than 60 centimeters of water, and their force vital capacity is less than 50% of predicted. In these particular cases, they can benefit from the use of non-invasive ventilation. And this may or may not be on the exam, but I just wanted to prep you. When I took my adult critical care specialist exam, there was a question on nocturnal hypoventilation. Uh, and I was talking a little bit earlier about Pickwickian syndrome. So basically, in nocturnal hypoventilation syndrome, uh, basically, if it's not caused by COPD, the first line of defense could be weight loss. The second line of defense could be oxygen therapy. The third line of defense could be given respiratory stimulants. And then uh, you could use CPAP with these patients. Uh, if their initial therapy doesn't work or they are severely ill, then you really need to use some non-invasive ventilation. But this question may come up and it's called nocturnal hypoventilation syndrome. And you remember the first line of choice is the lose weight oxygen therapy, respiratory stimulant. So remember if there's a multiple choice there, you need to pick all of them. This is a quick review of the patient interfaces when using non-invasive ventilation. I'm sure you all seen this. One of the things I really wanted to cover with you on this was that 18 to 40% of failure rates with non-invasive ventilation has to do with the interface. In other words, the patient doesn't tolerate it or if it's not on, put on properly. And there are many different choices. You've got nasal mask, you've got oral nasal mask, and sometimes you even got full face mask, which have been quite, uh, quite useful, especially with people who really need it. So I just wanted to give you a quick introduction. You know, there's little cushions that could be used to prevent skin breakdown.
And but this is one number one failure for re use of non-invasive ventilation is the interface because it's not comfortable or tolerated by the patient. One of the key components of having compliance with use of non-invasive ventilation is to have a proper fitting mask. So a proper fitting mask will reduce the likelihood of ulcers on the skin. It will reduce the likelihood of leaks. It'll increase patient comfort. And more importantly, it'll improve the long-term likelihood of patient tolerance. So getting a proper fitting, fitting mask is really important. And the manufacturers come up with some good guidelines for that. And you know as a respiratory therapist that this is really important. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with about patient interfaces and picking the right mask. The manufacturer has some good guidelines, and you as a respiratory therapist know it. But, you know, your ideal interface is leak-free. It has good stability. It's non-traumatic. It's lightweight. It's low cost, minimal dead space, um, low resistance to airflow. And, you know, you really want some good fitting mask. and. You want to have mask availability sizes because everyone's face is different. So you really want to make this properly. And some patients require a chin strap. And you can probably recognize who does need something and who doesn't. But the point is you want to have them tolerant on the mask. So how do you set up non-invasive ventilation on a patient. First of all, you have to choose a location that is appropriate that could be monitored. So, you know, based on the severity of the patient, you know, you want to be able to monitor the patient. You want to position the patient with the head of bed elevated to be greater than 30 degrees. You want to select the, uh, your non-invasive ventilation practice whatever you have you know you want to choose your mask you want to choose your uh, bipap device or you're going to use a ventilator that has non-invasive ventilation it's best to use humidification with it uh, rather than dry air because it dry it's more uncomfortable for the patient so humidification is key with using non-invasive ventilation so I wanted to go over some of the settings, and I'm sure this is a review for you. You know, you have your IPAP, you have your EPAP, you have your driving pressure, you have your backup respiratory rate, you have your inspiratory trigger, and you have your pressure, pressure rise time. IPAP. IPAP is positive inspiratory pressure, or PIP, and that is what is used to inflate the airway. EPAP is a setting adjusted, and basically think of EPAP as PEEP. The difference between IPAP and EPAP is your driving pressure or pressure support. So when you think about it, if you have a IPAP of 12 and an EPAP of five, what is your pressure support? Your pressure support is 12 minus five, which is seven. And when you really think about it, how much volume can you generate with a pressure support of seven? You know, you have mechanical ventilations, and a lot of times, you know, you got pressure support of 12, you got 14, you got 10. So when you think about the difference between the IPAP and EPAP, which is driving pressure or pressure support, consider that if you want to inflate the lung and you want to get bigger tidal volumes being delivered, you have to have a delta between the IPAP and EPAP that's effective. Your backup respiratory rate ensures that the patient who is unable to trigger the uh, device will have a backup rate that would help them. Inspiratory trigger, you know, you want to set it to a sensitivity level that it doesn't auto cycle, but it does capture all the breaths. And the pressure rise time um, can be adjusted based upon patient comfort. So these are some of your settings, and you really under, have to understand the difference between IPAP and EPAP and driving pressures, and you have to look at your return tidal volumes, which you're probably looking at a return tidal volume around seven cc's per kilogram based on ideal body weight. So how do you know if non-invasive ventilation is working on your patient? First of all, you'll see an improvement in the ABG. Your PCO2 will decrease. Your pH will increase. Your PAO2 will increase. You'll see an improvement clinically because of a decreased respiratory rate, increased tidal volumes, and diminished accessory use. So if you see all these things, these are all targeting successful application of non-invasive ventilation. How do you identify failure? If 
you put someone on non-invasive ventilation and they're on for one to two hours and no improvement occurred with anything I just mentioned above, like the PCO2, the pH and PAO2, respiratory rate, and so on. If you don't see an improvement after one to two hours, you need to intubate them. Stop it. Don't try to keep on making adjustments because the likelihood of an increased mortality as a result of your failure to intubate is really key. You may see this on the test. They're going to be talking about someone who's been on non-invasive ventilation for one to two hours. There's no improvement on the blood gas. What are you doing? They might tell you up the settings of the non-invasive ventilation, but that's not the right answer. The right answer is you got to intubate. I wanted to get a little further into the adjustments of non-invasive ventilation based upon patient presentation and blood gas. If your PCO2 is still high, you need to increase your IPAP. You need to increase your delta, the difference between your IPAP and EPAP. If you have low PCO2, you need to decrease your delta. That means you've got it, the range between the IPAP and EPAP has to be narrowed. If you have a high PAO2, you could decrease the oxygen or decrease the EPAP. But remember, if you decrease the EPAP, you have to be cognitive of the delta between the IPAP and EPAP. If you have a low PAO2, you've got to increase your oxygen or increase your PEEP. And when you think about PEEP, think about EPAP. EPAP equals PEEP. And again, you've got to consider the delta between the IPAP and EPAP because you want to consider when you're thinking about oxygenation, you also want to be thinking about ventilation. So you've got to make adjustments in both, in both categories. So I wanted to go over this slide with you about ventilators that use non-invasive ventilation versus a designated BiPAP device. Which one do you choose? So if you have a choice between a ventilator and a BiPAP device, I would absolutely pick the BiPAP device because that is designed to deliver higher peak airway flows than a, a ventilator would do it. So a lot of times, one of the major causes for failure of non-invasive ventilation is a leak. And a lot of times, um, ICU ventilators that use non-invasive ventilation don't have a very good leak compensation versus a, BAPTA, a BiPAP device. So if I, would, if I was you, I would lean toward using a designated BiPAP device rather than non-invasive ventilation in the ICU for a host of reasons. Number one, leaks are not picked up as easily. Number one, leak compensation is not good. Number two, number three, the peak inspiratory flow based on the inspiratory demands of the patient cannot meet the needs of the patient from the use of ventilators versus a BiPAP device, which has a peak inspiratory flow, which is much higher than a, than a ventilator. One of the advantages of a ventilator is you can monitor your exhale tidal volumes and you, know, you can intubate them right on the same spot. So that's one of the only advantages of a ventilator. So I have some questions for you. Number one, when can non-invasive ventilation be indicated? What are the indications for the use of non-invasive ventilation? I want you to think about it and then give me an answer. Number two, when is non-invasive ventilation contraindicated? What kind of conditions are a contraindication for the use of non-invasive ventilation? Again, think about it, give me an answer. Number three, which ventilator is the best choice for non-invasive ventilation? Which ventilator can offer the best practice of using for non-invasive ventilation? I'll give you a hint, it's a trick question. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I want you to know some summary points. First of all, non-invasive ventilation is a great tool to use hypercapnic respiratory failure is a great thing to use non-invasive ventilation for. Uh, pay attention to the interface that is used to deliver an IV. Remember I was telling you about the failure rate due to um, interface devices, so you got to be careful about making choices on the right interface device to make sure the patient is comfortable and compliant. Pay attention to contraindications of use. 
one of the contraindications is uh, if you put someone on non-invasive ventilation for one to two hours and they don't get better, don't keep on making adjustments intubate because if you don't see an improvement and the reason they're on it is because they've got a bad blood gas and you really need to see an improvement in their condition and finally is it better to use non-invasive than invasive ventilation what of course it is because if you cannot intubate somebody the likelihood of survivability is much better so if you could use non-invasive ventilation and the case calls for it that would be the better choice I want to thank you for joining this presentation and I have some listings of some good references that you could use for studying this test. Obviously Kettering and Lindsay Jones are really good sources as well as my partner Albert Yor. He has a very comprehensive uh, respiratory therapy exam preparation guide. So hopefully uh, you do very well during the exam.